Hello, fellas, and welcome back to another episode of Feed the Dark Podcast. Thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. I do really appreciate it. And for this episode, we are going to be talking about a novel that has been on my night table for about eight months. So thank you so much for inspiring me to finally fucking read it so now I can clear my night table off. Go you guys for motivation. It really really touches my heart how you guys motivate me. Thank you so much. And that novel is A Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay. The reason I was so excited about this was um, mostly internet hype, but also the internet hype stemmed from a quote by the king, Stephen King, which is placed at the top of this novel. A head full of ghosts scared the living hell out of me, and I'm pretty hard to scare, quote Stephen King. Now, fans of Stephen King over the years have learned to take his word with a grain of salt, hopefully, considering uh, he famously despised, the, in my opinion, the best adaptation of his novel, The Shining. Not the best as an adaptation, but the best movie. And he has praised some pretty questionable work in the past. Nevertheless, he is still the king. And for a new author, uh, this has pretty much skyrocketed him into the stratosphere in the horror world, um, especially with uh, future novels that I have yet to read that apparently Stephen King has also praised. So Stephen King and this guy get along. But for a new author, that is, that is really cool. And probably the, the highest praise that you can get, at least at this time. So this book is about um, a woman named Meredith. It starts out as her and as a 22 year old getting interviewed about incidences that happened when she was young. So it mostly is about Meredith as an eight year old and the incidences that happened to her family through the eyes of a child. So her 14 year old sister, Majori, gets possessed. Maybe, maybe she's just mentally ill. Maybe she's faking it. Who the fuck knows? But it's, it's really interesting because you get the perspective of that and you also through her eyes, see how it deteriorates and how the effects that it has on her parents, Sarah and John, who play a major role in this. As the story progresses, then they don't know how to deal with what's happening to her and doctors can't figure it out. Somehow, and I don't really want to say how, a, a, a TV crew comes in. It becomes a reality TV show while it's also in a regular book narrative. And on top of that, it's jumping from time to the future to the past. And also, the interviewer is writing blogs about the interviews. So you get that perspective as well. This book jumps in style so much. But I heard some people say it was jarring online. To me, it I mean, it was a little, you know, I, I found it more impressive than jarring. I was like, holy shit, this author can write in so many different styles. And also, I mean... It, it kind of um, excuses itself from being a generic sort of possession story because it references so many other uh, great works of fiction, whether they be novels or film. For instance, it references The Thing. It constantly references The Exorcist and Evil Dead 2 and some of my favorite, Come Closer, which is a book that I just read this weekend, which I was like, holy shit, this, this guy knows what the fuck he's talking about. And I, I really do appreciate that because that, that made it more uh, that made it more relatable, and I felt like the author is on the same page as me during some scenes that otherwise would have felt a little bit generic, but they didn't. It is um it is a bit of a satire. I mean, there are passages uh, describing the reality TV show that are just very obviously making fun of the entire concept of reality TV shows, and they're uh, very obviously making fun of all the Exorcist ripoffs while also kind of emulating some of those scenes from The Exorcist and every Exorcist ripoffs, like the vomiting and the head spinning and the, you know, the fucking cabinets vibrating and, and all of that. So I thought it was, uh, it, it was fun in that way. I will say that this book didn't really scare me at all. At all, actually. I, I mean, I thought it was very interesting, and I loved reading it, but... I mean, once again, to go back to his quote, a head full of ghosts scared the living hell out of me. I'm pretty hard to scare. I don't know what the fuck he was talking about. I, I mean, 
for a little bit there, I was, I'm not going to lie. I was a little bit nervous because it seems for a little bit to be a kind of generic possession story for all the reasons I mentioned, other than the critiques and other than the meta aspects and the interesting writing styles and the jumping back and forth. All that I thought was fascinating, but the actual scare scenes were basically just the exorcist. I mean, once again, there was a vomiting, there was the, uh, there were the night tables shaking and the bed shaking, and there was um, her, uh, the majority, the woman who was 14 years old who was, you know, possessed or not possessed, uh, saying crazy sexual shit and cursing at parents and saying, uh, you know, remembering uh, certain historical things that she should not have remembered. And pretty much, if you watch The Exorcist, you've pretty much seen all the scary scenes in this, in, in my opinion. So that was a little confusing, unless Stephen King just saw The Exorcist and was like, fuck, anything that resembles The Exorcist scares the shit out of me. I don't know, but I I really do appreciate this book for the writing. I, I think it's worth reading, and I saw a lot of the top reviews on Amazon, which is t- really not much to go by because they're not professional reviews. Some of them were negative because of the ending, and this is the main, main reason I want to talk about this. Other than the, the writing style, which once again, I've Do not mean to be repetitive, but it is fascinating. But the real reason why this stuck with me was the ending. So I really want to talk about this in a non-spoiler way because I want people, like many other books that I've reviewed, I do want people to engage in this novel for themselves. But if you're not going to, because I've recommended a few books at this point, totally understandable. Um, But if you do want to, then tune out at the count of three. Three, two, one. Spoilers. So my favorite thing about this novel is what I sa- I found many people to hate. Many people online were furious at the ending. And it is wa- the, honestly the only reason it stuck with me. Once again, the writing style was cool and I like the reality TV show and the critiques and all that. But I really would not have remembered this book if it wasn't for the last 30 pages or so. So what happens at the end of this book is that you, you're you kind of led to believe like, okay, either she's going to be actually possessed or this is just going to be her making it up. Because there are parts in the er- earlier on of the novel where y- they could explain away some of the possession aspects. Like, oh, like she explains to her sister, like, oh, no, I was just doing this. But you're never really sure. And there are parts even, yeah, towards the end where there are going to be actual exorcism sequences with uh, the priests and the reality TV show that like, like, oh no, it could be explained away on this. So my favorite part of this, which everyone hates, once again, major spoiler, the entire family gets poisoned and then they die. And this, at first, you think, is from the perspective of, not the perspective, and this, at first, you think, is due to the father, John. Now, John has become a born-again Christian and a very religious man over the entire course of this. He, was, uh, he lost his job, and he saw his daughter being possessed, and he, uh, he was emailing people saying that, like, you know, other Christians who were like, oh, you know what you have to do, and he got cyanide and decided to, from at this point of the book, to kill his entire family because he thought they were all doomed. And, I, I mean, I thought that was great because this is a this is the first of two twists. I thought this one was great because at first you think that, okay, wow, it's actually the super religious Christian who just went out of his fucking mind, and he is the reason, and I like the a- ambiguity of it. And then the second twist came, which I thought was even more heartbreaking and interesting and it was that actually the dad had cyanide or whatever substance he had to poison his family and the email still existed although Mar- uh, Marjorie who the is the uh, sister who was possessed spoke to Meredith and said that oh it's really like dad is trying to kill us here here's the proof you know it you know what you have to do which is to uh, to poison dad and to put it in the sauce of a spaghetti that they're making that night. So Meredith, the one recollecting this story, actually puts the poison 
in Vsauce to poison the father. And you think, and from the world's perspective, you think it's just the father, and that's what ev- the story that everyone accepts. But she's the one who does it. And then the mother takes the sauce, and she starts eating it. And then and Marjorie, the one who is possessed, who told her to put the poison in the sauce, while they're at the dinner table, asks the eight-year-old girl who is forced to do this for to, to pass a spaghetti sauce. And she's just kind of sitting there like, whoa, no, I don't, I don't want to. And then the parents are like, all right, we'll just pass you the sauce. It's fine. And that's it. And then she just dies laughing. And it's, it's horrifying. And my favorite part, which once again, I get why people hate this. People were expecting some possession ending and some crazy fucking, you know, generic or general exorcism type thing. But the fact that she died laughing and she was the one who set this whole thing up, it's so open-ended and, and you don't really know you whether she was actually possessed or not and it, i th- i think that is fascinating and she the fact that she left her sister in this uh in this life just knowing that she did all that i, I think that is a much darker ending and i i love that because that made me rethink literally the entire book i was like wait a minute what what the fuck and, and if it wasn't for that and if it was a general exorcism type thing then i would have been Honestly, a, a little disappointed. I, but yeah, no, I, w- I went back in the book and I, I pretty much skimmed through it a second time as soon as I finished it. And I was like, wait a minute, what, what in the hell? I, I am, I am amazed that he had the balls to do this. And I, and the fact that, she, and looking back and seeing that she was so obsessed with all this was just so obsessed with exorcisms and analyzing this as an adult was, was so fascinating. I mean, I think this book is, once again, not, not particularly scary, but just very interesting. And there are some things that I forgot to mention uh, about the reality TV show. Like, for instance, they, they go into the aspects of how this affected the family and how this aspect affected them at school and the protesters at their house. And it was a very interesting commentary on modern day society pretty much over the past 20 years. So I think this was a very worthwhile read. Um, I disagree with Stephen King once again I don't think it was scary but I think that the ending really made this book incredibly fascinating and not to get too much into some reviews I've read but I've read some people saying like oh this is like if you watched the thing and at the end they just killed themselves I I totally disagree I think this was an a very appropriate ending for the vague way that the author Paul Tremblay for the vague way that the author Paul Tremblay purposely designed this novel and um i think it's a really interesting critique of modern day society and how and how and religion and of horror in general honestly this really makes fun of horror and possession stories as a as a genre and how people would react if this was a real case and just how we exploit families and uh yeah that that combined with the the questions I have at the end were amazing. And uh, yeah, no, don't, by the way, don't get me wrong. I don't always like an open ending. There's, there's a lot of movies that have open, you know, questions where I'm like, all right, just fucking tell me. That's not an ending. This, I feel, was one of the few cases where an ambiguous and open ending was entirely appropriate and could create an actual dialogue between readers that is much more substantial than other open endings that I've seen or read in books and movies. Well, thank you so much again for tuning in to Feed the Dark Podcast. And um, yeah, you could find me on YouTube and soon to be Spotify and Apple Music and Lipson. See you next time.